Hi, Vincent Hall, and welcome to another episode of Anyone Can Draw, Paint, or Create. As promised, today we're moving away from lines and trying something completely opposite, which is a dab mm, or a daub. Believe it or not, the dictionary has two different definitions. D-A-B means initially to press something lightly to remove it or to just simply press into something lightly, whereas a daub, D-A-U-B, means a liberal and random act of placing objects or things down onto a surface, usually with a sticky substance, which could be paint. So I guess we will be dabbing with color pencil and daubing with paint. In any event, this will be a fun exercise to try, whether you only have colored pencils at home or only have paint or you wanna try some of each, it really doesn't matter. We're gonna be looking first though at two of the most premier artists that use dabs or daubs in order to create the effect that they wanted with their work. I'm sure many of you have heard of Claude Monet and Georges Seurat. Both of them used dabs and short strokes, and in Seurat's case, tiny dots sometimes, pointillism, in order to achieve layers and depth and have that very creamy, soft focus that is indicative of their work in the Impressionist period. You can use lots of materials for this, and as I move along with the video, you'll be seeing some of the materials that we're using, but just to show you a few, and we've used these before, handy dandy Q-tips, only we're using them in a handy dandy bunch. So we're gonna be adding paint to several Q-tips at once, securing them with a rubber band. We're also going to be using different kinds of brushes. So we have round brushes, small brushes, and even a flat brush. Because for the painting part, I'm gonna be laying in my sky first, just with an underpainting of blue, just to kind of speed things along. The last thing, is a wine cork. Wine corks come in different sizes. This one's pretty big. I could use the top or the bottom one, but it's gonna be used to make some really nice circular jobs, especially for my sky, instead of a sponge, so I can keep that round shape. And what's wrong with a reason to open a bottle of wine now and then and enjoy a glass? So keep your wine cork if you have one. We're also gonna be using something to mask off an area of the painting from what I'm doing. I'm gonna be doing a rural scene that involves a fence. For my drawing, rather than have white pencil for the fence and then have the chance of it not showing up, I'm gonna be using masking tape, a very thin sized masking tape. If you've ever seen some of Ted Womstad's paintings, Mr. Womstad does some amazing technically skilled work in architecture and boats and mechanical things, cars, all those sorts of things. And tape has been key to get those beautifully straight edges that you want when you want a razor sharp edge. Of course, he also has one of the steadiest hands in painting I've ever seen in my career. So I don't know that he really needs the tape, but it's a technique that I'm gonna show you today too. So stay tuned, this should be lots of fun. This one is by Claude Monet, and it has all of the different techniques that we just talked about with light dabs and bigger daubs where things are roughed in. But if I zoom in and you can see even in a reproduction from the internet that you can see how even the sky has short strokes and tiny little short strokes for the trees. And notice that they're going in very random patterns. They give the illusion of brush and thickness of growth whereas the flowers are all more vertical dabs. So he might have dabbed one on top of the other and then gone in on top to show the little tips of the flowers. Conversely, Seurat in this picture here uses very deliberate, almost symmetrical dabs where a Q-tip might work just fine for this because the edge is the same shape each time or drawing the shape first with a colored pencil if we're going that route. But you can see everything is very clean edge, almost um, in a way not to demean the work at all, I'm not, but you, if you follow the lines of a coloring book, like a pattern, or um, if you were doing posterization or a silkscreen print, it looks a lot like that. The sky has green and yellow and purple and lavender and white and even some grays. And it's all laid in in very deliberate, tiny, tiny little dabs. 
This one is labeled unknown because I was just looking for some Google searches and I really liked the way the C looked in this. So if you were doing something, as kind of reminds me of maybe the Cliffs of Moore, an interpretation of it, these go in random directions, almost like pixels on a, a very low resolution photograph, but it's a painting and it's all done with tiny little dots. If you like animals, you can do that. Here's a dog, nothing like a dog that shakes. If you've ever had a pet and given them a bath, you know that shake spirals out of control. So this idea of going around and around with the dabs gives us a sense of this dog shaking off water and the puddles and all kinds of wonderfully rich colors. This horse here is very soft as opposed to how the dog had very defined edges. But you can build up a horse or a shape that's something very more realistic by simply dabbing the same color and little light areas and then darker areas over it while it's still wet. And we'll move up here. We have two more. This one, again, show, this is another Syrah painting and again a little less defined than the one that was just that tree a minute ago but still he has a lot of strokes that all go the same direction and then some that kind of almost blur as they go across so part of this is to understand you can go in opposite directions and blend things in they don't all have to appear to be hard-edged circles or dots or things like that i liked this one because it's a Syrah but we don't often think of Syrah in terms of something that looks more like an etching. It's not an etching. He did this as a painting. It's almost like what we did last week with the sepia underpainting, but the beauty of all of the soft shadows and the dots that go in to just to define these houses and then the tree limbs and things. So I just thought that was an interesting one as well. This one here, this reminds me an awful lot of some of the paintings that uh, Mr. Lonnie Colors that you saw in one of our featured series a few weeks ago does. Throwing in a small barn scene in a very rural pastoral setting and then using a lot of horizontal lines to define the depth of field. And again, this one has thicker strokes. Some of these could have been done with a palette knife. I'm sure we're very familiar with this one, but I don't have a very good copy of the boaters, but this is, well, one of the series of boaters, the scene. And you can see, I just wanted to bring this one in so you could just get a sense of the fact that even though the trees, when we zoom out, read brown, there's purple in the trees. So mixing colors is a lot of fun too. And then lastly, this one, because I just love the way the sky looks in this and the boats out on the water, not being afraid to bring in pinks and yellows and all these other colors into the greens. And this person has a parasol here, a little red one that sticks up. And then we've got the dark edges of the cliffs for negative space. And the clouds almost don't look real, but that's okay. It doesn't have to be, this is an interpretation. So that's the essence of where we're headed today. I thought you might like to see some of these samples of professional work before we get started on what I'm going to do. I took this image as we were taking a walk outside of the county Limerick in Ireland a few years back, and I just loved the simplicity of this road and this tiny fence. This is what I was talking about that we're gonna use that thin tape for to kind of give this fence. There are a lot of cattle behind that fence on the other side and they came over, not in this shot, just as a little side note, because they thought I was leading them to literally greener pastures. They wanted to get to the other side of the road. They were not happy when I did not open the gate and they mooed accordingly. So this is why I'm using a blue background to start. I don't want to do this entire painting in the dab and daub technique and it's okay to do an underpainting if you just want to lay in a color. Just wanted to show you what I'll be working on so you'll be able to see as my painting evolves what my inspiration is. I'm going to start using color pencil and then give you a sense of how you can lay in these dabs and daubs using a color pencil and this masking tape idea and then I'll move on to the acrylic painting. So let's get started with our drawing.
I already took the liberty of laying in some of the masking tape because I don't think it's that exciting to watch me tear up masking tape, but I'll show you how it's done with the vertical post on the fence. So I put in my rails and I left the tape on the side of my paper. This helps hold the paper down, by the way, but I also wanted you to be able to see better where that tape was. And I just laid them out. They don't have to be perfect because this is a pretty old metal fence. And now I'm just going to go ahead and and connect them and just kind of tear off. You can use the scissors if you want and the tree, like the growth goes beyond that. So I'm not gonna worry too much about that. And then that's the rest of that little white metal color of the taped area. The rest of it's gonna be colored pencil. So we've got that first and let's get started. Since the majority of my got some tape on my finger there we go since the majority of my drawing is green i'm just going to lay this roughly in with green and i'm doing what we had done before which is a contour outline of where i see the tree coming around to where the road is and the tree goes off the page in a lot of direction then i have my horizon line here this comes up and there's some more trees and I'm probably going to not do as many of the trees as are seen. Then the road here goes right off the side, goes right back into that tree area. There's a little bit of an area here and then some more tree growth. Then I'll just block in where there's some variations on different plant growth or vegetation, especially here along the fence, we've got some different size weeds, I guess, maybe um, natural native species, we'll call it that. That sounds a little more politically correct for all of the growth that might be here. And just a couple of lines to show where some of those branches might go. And then where the fence is here, we have this side and then there's a darker area and then this big tree, which doesn't look like a tree at all, but that's how we're gonna get started. So. To do this with the dab or the daub technique, there's a couple of things you can do. If you work small, and I do not recommend this for larger areas, but if you work small, you can do this, which is a lot of dots. And I suggest doing this if you're by yourself because that could drive some other people crazy. And I know down in the art center, several folks have not been too happy with folks doing these. But there's other techniques too. I could also make circles. So if you can see here, I know I have this tape to the paper, but I can hold it up a little bit. I'm making little tiny ovals or circles of some of these dark colors. The last idea that you could do, if you really like to plan things, is just make a bunch of outlines that you can color in later. This is more of a Seurat approach as opposed to Monet who had a more liberal hand, and I can later fill these in. So I could do outlines, I could do solid dots, or, I, or solid dots here, or I can do filled in oval shapes. Either way, the whole idea is I'm going to be building those up. So I'll start coloring in some yellow because we know yellow over green is gonna make a lighter green. So I could color those in the, um, the same color or I can use, pencils are stuck here, um, a different color. So maybe I'll go in with a lighter green in some of these areas here too, and just start filling them in. So I think you can get the idea of where we're going and getting that. What I wanted to show you was how we can get the different idea of what the tape can do to give us this nice outline. So I'm just going to do some really close together dabs because there's a dark green around this edge of the fence. And if you can see and hear, I'm making little dabs and dots and coloring in very similar to what I did up here. Then I'm gonna take another green and build up a layer. And if you wanna try this with pastel or chalk, or even a regular pencil and do a black and white or a value study in grays, that would be beautiful. And that's certainly an option if you want to try that. And I think, just add in 
a wee bit of yellow in some of these areas here because there are little tiny glimpses of sunlight coming through on this darker part of the fence. Now I'm going to put this back down so I can finish this drawing, but I'm gonna take the tape off a bit just to show you what this can do. That is gorgeous. That's a beautiful edge. That way you don't have to worry about it. If you have thicker masking tape and not this thin stuff, you can go ahead and, um, I just took it off. <laughs> I'll add it, add it back in, no big deal there. There we go. Um, you can go ahead and cut your masking tape with the scissors. So don't worry about that. If you don't like doing the masking tape approach, another idea would simply be to take something else like another paper or a cardboard edge and just go along that. It'll give you the same result. It's just something that you can do to block the area so that it doesn't get pigment where you don't want it. As we know, white color pencil does not show up so much white once we have other colors on top of it. So that's what I'm going to do there for the road, just to give you a little start on that. I'm actually going to use a lavender, even though it's gray, but it has like a, a pretty, kind of like a, a warmish tone to it. So I'm gonna warm up my black and gray a little bit. And I'm doing very short lines because I want this to go horizontal. If your hand works better always going vertical, just turn the paper around and you can go that way. Now I have mine taped down, so I'm not going to do that, but I'm just going over this and then I would build that up with a more neutral color. There's my black on top of it, but I'm not gonna go too heavy because this road has sunlight on it, so I don't want it to get too dark. And you can hear the cadence of my pencil. It's very specific dot, 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 but it's also giving you some little random edges. So vertical, horizontal, it doesn't matter. As you see this progress, you'll get a chance to see how my lines start going in a variety of directions. But that's enough for the drawing part. Those of you that are starting the drawing, this will give you a chance to get your idea roughed in, block out areas that you want, and pick your materials that you wanna use as your medium. On to the painting. I already did my underpainting of the sky. It's basically just staining the canvas. And what we did last week was use browns and sepia tones to do an underpainting. You can use really any color. So this sky, it's just an underpainting, so I'm not working with strictly white canvas. And although most of this is going to be green down here, and I could have done an underpainting of just green here too, I wanted to show you more of the technique that we're going to be doing, so I left that white. This, however, is just gonna dry, and it doesn't matter if we work over it with another color. So how do we get in these areas? I like to start with a brush and then work back into it with some of the other more unconventional materials like the Q-tips and the wine cork. So I'll start with a small brush. It can be a round brush or a flat brush. Mine's a flat brush. And I am just going to lightly wet the brush. And you can see here, um, what I've done is I've put families of colors in the same little well. So I have two greens together. I have two blues together, two yellows and two browns. And you'll see why when we get to those Q-tips. So I'm just gonna see what color I have here. I want it to be light. And unlike doing the contour outline drawing, I'm going to actually just start dabbing in little areas where I see my tree, just to kind of give myself a reference point of where my tree is, comes down here, versus my road. And since there is green on this road and it pretty much goes right off the canvas there, and then my road comes down here. I'm using the road on this picture as my defining point of where to plot everything else. Because once I know where I have this road, I'll know where to put my other things. Then I can just go around here. This also gives you control. So for those of you like me that are a bit of a control freak and I like to know what I'm doing before I actually go in and do it, this gives me a chance to plan where I'm going. Of course, being free and loose with this can also work because I could just start randomly dabbing in colors 
and really just go for it. So there's my road. Here's a little bit more. And I'm not using much paint because this is really just a map. And it's a very, very small little map. Okay, so this just kind of gives me the sense of what's where and it kind of looks pretty abstract, but that's okay. Because I wanna start laying in my green grasses with the unconventional materials, these Q-tips. You could use one which wouldn't be too hard to do. So I'll show you what one does. It does pretty much what it would you would think it would do. <laughs> it's just gonna give you these nice soft little dabs. I guess actually the Q-tips are more of a daub now that I think about it. <laughs> They're a little thicker. So we could do that, but the beauty of this is, especially for those of us who are a little impatient to get to the end product, is if we take a handful of Q-tips, you could tape them together if you have your masking tape, but I have a small elastic, so I will just wrap this around a couple of times till it's secure. And now I have basically a double-ended impressionist brush made out of Q-tips, no big surprise. This is why we put color families together. By having the two greens together, I can go in and start getting my darker colored greens. And there's gonna be two different tones of them. I think I got more of one than the other, and that's okay, we can go back in with this. And start laying in my darker areas. There's a bit of a dark area that comes along the fence. Now, I don't have tape for my fence on my painting because I'm gonna use white paint over top of it. However, I am going to use tape to make the straight line. So you will see how to use tape with acrylic painting as well. Once I get some of my darks in, and you can see they'll blend in, I can switch to the other side and go get my two yellows. There we go. And you, if you see here, there's a lot of paint on here and some pick up more than others and that's fine. And as I start dabbing this in, this is where the impressionist magic starts to happen. We start to get this build of color on color. Oh, this looks so cool. I'm gonna pick this up in a minute and show you what we're getting with all of this. Dabs in here. There we go. So you can start to see there are these soft little dabs and daubs of color. Use the words interchangeably, why not? And I'm starting to build up this meadow. I'm going to do the same thing with the sky here in a minute. But first I wanna fill in the rest of this. So while I'm doing that, and getting blue on my finger. <laughs> so while I'm doing that, oh goodness, I'm going to go back to my drawing too, and I'll catch up with you in a few minutes once we've made some progress. If you're a painter, now's the time to plan your color palette get your materials organized, do not put your finger in the paint, <laughs> and I'll see you right back. We're back to the drawing, and I think you can see that I've been able to lay in a little bit of tones and different greens to kind of build up that texture of a lot of leafy growth. But I wanted to come back to it at this point to show you how to lay in something like the dappled shadows of the leaves on the road and what to do with the sky. We'll start with the sky. Same thing that we did with the painting, where as I laid in the sky as an underpainting, here's where you can always, I hate to say the word cheat, but we'll just say we can um, modify and just kind of lay in a little bit of blue. And you can see I'm not going horizontal, I'm going on an angle because I wanna build this up with our cross hatching technique that we had done before. Now I could do this all in dabs, and daubs, but I'm going to reserve that just to build up a few areas for clouds. So I'm just lightly laying in a sky by going two opposite directions. That way it still has some texture and it looks like a drawing, but it's not um, going to be the actual heavy dabs and daubs. I'm saving that for the actual subject matter. So we just did a little quick lay in. It's almost hard to see. You'll see it more at the finished result at the end. And now what I'm gonna do is take that same blue and kind of come down over my road and lay in, excuse me, an underpainting of the road 
just so that we can get a tone that I can then build up my dabs and my daubs. So here come the dabs and daubs on the road. I am going to take black and make a lot of little circles. I'm almost not picking up my pencil, but I am. I'm making a um, series of ovals that are just going to simulate the shadow of the tree from the other side of the road that we don't see. And that's the beauty of shadows is that they imply things that we can't see, but our brain fills it in and we think it's actually there. So when you see this at the end result, you'll actually think there's a tree in the painting on the other side because this shadow has given your brain enough to fill in the dots, so to speak, so that it knows what was there. That's the beauty of um, how our thought processes work. For example, if I drew a half of a circle, you could probably fill in the rest of it and your brain would see it as a whole circle. Those are fun exercises, by the way. They're those little brain games and teasers and you can get those online or buy a book or something. They're kind of fun to do as well. Then I can go back in here and do a few short dabs and daubs just to get some of the shadows that were showing up here and there alongside the road. And I'm just using the side of my pencil and making some, some little dabs that way. So I'll continue this part off because it goes all dark down here and it's pretty repetitious. It's just making those circles. So to get the shading more vertical for the growth of the weeds alongside the road, I'm going to make very short lines. Short lines are just like dabs or daubs. It's just we're giving a vertical approach to this because I really want this to start to look like growth. And if I make everything circles, I mean, and I could, but I don't think I would get the same effect. Then I'm gonna go back in here and make short lines with my yellow and start to build up the grasses and then go back in with my dark green pencil and see, <laughs> pencil points do that when you sharpen them too far. But by making these short, short lines, they're still gonna read as dabs, but I'm really starting to get that shading in that I wanna get here. And sometimes that's the only way to go, is to use these colors. And then bringing this yellow back in to soften that dark green a little bit more. So I'll hold this up, because I'm gonna take this fence off in a minute anyway. So you can start to see how some of these lines will still read as the dabs and the daubs, especially as we go over them with some other dots of color. But I'm just trying to build up a richness of tone here. So I hope you can see all of that. Now what I've done is get most of what I wanted in for the fence because some of this, um, put a little more yellow in here, some of this uh, growth is going to go up over my fence post. So it's time to remove the tape. And this is always the fun part because you get to see instant gratification. And it's like, wow, look at these cool lines that I did. Thanks to the masking tape. And then there's one little vertical piece here that I'm gonna pull off. And there you go. So now we have, we can just throw out that tape. Our vertical line, our horizontal lines for our fence, and we don't have to do anything more to that except where there are some breaks where the grasses come up, I can do some little dabs just to break this up because I've yet to see perfect growth out in nature. Everything sort of, it's perfectly imperfect, but it does have things that break the surface. It's not gonna be perfectly even. And you can see by doing that with this front post, it gives the sense that this is on the bottom. Now these, I wouldn't break the surface. I would leave those be exactly the way they are. There are no weeds or growth coming up through there. And I would just continue on building up these layers of greens and yellows and going from there. I'll continue with this and come back to show you the final results, but I wanted to show you one other thing which involves branches, because this looks like a lot of green, but you're like, okay, where in the world do we go with the branches? So I'm gonna grab um, 
This is a, a Tuscan Rouge, which is kind of like a brownish red, which will work just fine because red and green are complements, so this should work just as well. And I'm just gonna do little dots, but keep them going together, and then let it break, and then come back, because branches have leaves that show through them, and then they stop, and then they come again, and then they go back down. And just give a few little ideas of some branches kind of coming out this way. You can use tiny little dots for this. So you don't have to draw a line. This can all be done with dots too. And by doing that, I know the cadence can get maddening if it bothers you, I apologize. But I just wanna get a few more in here before I hold this up so that you can see what I'm talking about. And then this one here, had a branch that just completely followed those leaves. And there we go. So this will give you an example. These are dots, there's no line here, but it looks like a line and it actually works better with trees because you wanna have this broken line rather than drawing really heavy lines for a tree trunk and then having to break them up later with an eraser. This will give you more control. So here's where we're gonna stop for now on the drawing. This is where you should be following along and building up your layers and going different directions. You can turn your paper around. I'll even do this upside down if it's easier for me to see where I wanna go with some branches. There's no right or wrong, whichever way your hand works best. And then we'll fill in the rest of the sky and pretty much be finished with the drawing. Now we'll go back to that painting for one more time. As promised, we're going to use the masking tape on this painting, but we're using it almost in reverse. So I am laying down strips of tape, but you're probably noticing I have a lot more tape than I did for my drawing. The reason is I'm using this tape to mask off areas where I'm gonna paint those thin little lines between the tape. And boy, can this get confusing. I've been there many a time where I've had tape laid in, and the nice thing of this is I can leave the tape go up much higher than I need. Um, that doesn't matter at all. I'm just using it to create an edge. There we go. So we have this roughed in tape, and this is where the white fence is going to go in, but there's these teeny little lines. I'm just gonna use a very small brush with some white. So I've got my smallest brush right here pardon my arm, and I am just taking paint. This is dry brush, so I'm taking my white with no water, and I am just dabbing it in between the tape. Once you do this, you really have to let this dry because otherwise, if you pull the tape off, the paint will just go every which way. And I'm just going right in. If you have thicker masking tape, now would be a good time to use that because then you can just paint the whole area in and not have to worry about going outside the tape lines. Which, I mean, if you're doing this expressionistically, wouldn't matter anyway. But I'm trying to stay true to my inspiration. And I just want these to be some nice edges just to give it a little bit of a different look from everything else, which is totally dots. But I am putting my paint in, in dabbing strokes. So I think that still counts, <laughs> uh, keeping it still impressionistic and dabbing. And I went out of the lines a little bit there, but that's okay, because that's where that brush kind of grows up. And by brush, I don't mean my brush I'm painting with, I mean the, um, the brush outside of the, um, the green grass. So, okay, that's about as far as my fence goes. And I'm just gonna let that dry. I'm gonna leave it alone. We're not gonna do anything with that. I'll bring my water closer. What I'm going to do now is take a bigger round brush and go ahead and put in my road. So I'm gonna use white, but now I have the white with a little bit of the, um, the yellow mixed in, which is fine, so it'll give it a little bit of a warm feel, and I'm just dabbing all this in just to get some tones. And then I'm gonna go in with a little bit of this bluish color here. 
and dab this in. And yeah, I know right now it's gonna start to look, now you can see with a bigger brush when I dab, it almost looks the same as if I were just getting one solid color. But trust me, the texture will still show through. It really won't matter. There we go. We're just laying this in, and this blue is going to read actually more of a gray. Once we mix it in here a little bit more, we'll pick up the rest of this white. I might have to go get some more white, but we've got a nice gray here, and I'm just gonna start to neutralize that down. with the black. Get it a little darker here. Now don't get afraid if it gets darker. I'm using the side of my brush now to dab and I'm getting these really nice soft shadows of where that tree that we talked about in the drawing, the implied tree, because it's just a shadow. It, there's no actual tree on the other side that we can see, but it is showing a shadow on the road. And I'm leaving some areas intentionally light and I'm going in and getting some areas intentionally darker just to give that edge that you would see with a shadow because the shadow at high noon, and this looks like it's pretty bright day, would give you a pretty direct area of a shadow on the road. So, okay, I think I'll leave that, that go there. And then I will show you the same technique again with the branches that we just did with the um, drawing, which is to take the black and this brown and just mixing it up to get this darker Tuscany red brown because I don't have Tuscan red paint, but I do have magenta. So if I mix that with my browns and blacks, I'll get a pretty nice darker tone. And I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm just gonna dab here and there and break it up, less is more and just kind of show some little branches. Stop, show some little branches. Kind of come in here a little bit, break it up. With this, like I had said, less is more. You don't want to overdo this. You just want to give the viewer the sense that there were some branches. Get a little thicker one over here, because I'm going to go back into that again, and that there's more of like a trunk coming down on this side and maybe some coming up here. Remember that old phrase of if you use it somewhere, use it somewhere else. So don't just use that same brown on one tree and leave it alone. You can even like kind of show a few dots over here. It'll help unify your painting. And I'm all about keeping things unified so that the painting has some nice, nice rest areas for your eye and also flows together which will give it a nicer aesthetic. So anyway, woo, there we go. We'll just kind of wipe that out. If you get too much of something, you can always wipe it out doing that. So the last thing I wanted to show you was the wine cork. And for that, I am going to take some more white. I am running out of white. White goes fast. If you're buying paint, always get the bigger tube of white because you'll use it, trust me. And I'm going to take my cork, using my pencil case to hold this palette up so you can see the colors better, and I'm dabbing it onto a paper towel so that I don't have a huge blob of paint, but that I have some. And the cork is going to absorb this paint, but it has a nice edge to it. And now I'm going to go back in and use it to get some of the lights on my row that then I'll brush that in to get it a little softer, but I'm gonna use it to make a few clouds up in my sky. And don't be afraid about pressing in and getting these edges, it's kind of fun. I'm dabbing it on the side. I'm not necessarily using it completely as um, a circle. Boy, does that absorb fast, that's why it's cork and dabbing in here and getting some really cool clouds. Might be able to see them better up here on the top. So using a wine cork instead of a sponge, because this is a similar look, but frankly, I like holding the cork better. It's a little more um, sturdy, and I can actually create really nice edges now of where the sky is ending and where the tree is starting by using this to create this harder edge. 
and go around here. And then here, if I just pull this a little bit as I'm painting, just a little dabby pull, still dabbing, it's still daubing, I can really start to get that mottled look of the sun coming through. I can even do a little bit more along this edge and bring back the idea of sun on the road. And let's see, one more just cause it looks like there's some dabbles here. There we go. That's pretty, oh my goodness. That's pretty much it of what you would want to do with paint. You could do this with the green if you wanted to. So if you have a lot of wine corks, some people collect them, you can use them. You can also break up the tree a little bit. I think I'll do that. This is still wet, so it's just kind of blending it in a little bit. So the wine cork is a really efficient painting tool for impressionist style painting. The last thing here, then we're gonna let this one dry and I'll pull off that tape after the white is completely dry or we're gonna have a bonafide disaster, is go in next to where I just put some of my sun dabs and get a little darker because the rule of thumb is where you have a highlight, you usually have a dark shadow next to it. And that'll start to give this road just a little more depth as I go around where some of the white areas were and just kind of pull that out. So that's just one of those little last things that I might wanna do. Then I'm also looking in here and finding where I need to go a little bit lighter I'm gonna take some white first and paint that in, but while it's still wet, I'm taking my yellow and my green and going back over that because I just needed to lighten this up. There's another little brushy area over here that needed some lightening. It's always nice to look at your painting, talk to yourself, see where you are, it's okay to go back and forth. And yeah, this is the one time where you can talk to yourself and nobody's gonna question it. Because in art, the artist is always making decisions and always making compromises or changes as they go along as it'll work best for their painting. Okay, so that's it. The next time you see this painting, I think I'll be pretty much done. I will have laid in a few more shadows along the edge of the road finish this up here. I'm going to pull the tape off and show you what that looks like. And then we'll be done with both our drawing and our painted version of dabbing or daubing. Well, here's the moment of truth for that tape on the painting. So we'll pull this across and pull this piece off. And we should have our white lines for our fence. They're a little more subtle than the other one. I still have one more piece of tape here. Of course, there's always one that doesn't want to come off. Oh no. I'll go this way. And <laughs> there's always more than one way to pull a piece of tape. There we go. So we have very subtle lines, which is what I wanted for my painting because I don't want them to overpower the rest of the work. But if there's an area that you need to go back into, like right here where they didn't quite connect, you can always fill in the dots with some white paint. And I'm gonna bring down the um, vertical post just a little bit more, but I like how it's pretty subtle on here and it's not overkill. At that point too, I can take a little more of my greens, mix up some green and yellow and just do my last little dabs here just to break the surface now and then so that it does look like um, the growth of the foliage and the, the ground cover and that that fence isn't just 100% sticking out of the middle of nowhere. So the bottom one I'm kind of annihilating a little bit just to um, make it look like it's down there on the bottom. But other than that, found a little spot there. I would say that's completely finished. So whether you say dab or you say daub, I hope you got a chance to see how a new technique can work for your painting or drawing experience. As you move through this, just remember, go slow. If you're doing the drawing, 
I suggest maybe a little smaller than what I did. Um, I would still keep working on this, but for the most part, I'm gonna say that one's finished. If you're doing the painting, remember the whole idea is subtlety and showing these beautiful shadows by using things such as Q-tips, little brushes, a wine cork, whatever works best for you. The idea is to have fun. And I hope you are having fun with these projects. If you are celebrating Father's Day on Sunday, happy Father's Day to all of you at Vincent Hall that are fathers, grandfathers, uncles, godfathers, or just played a role in someone's life that was fatherly. I, everyone appreciates that. And I hope you enjoy your special day. Until next week, enjoy the rest of your week, Vincent Hall. Keep creating, and I will see you soon.